Everybody, we're going to give a, the stragglers a few minutes to come in, but if you would like to, we have a sign-up sheet in the back, so we can collect your information, so if we have any follow-up meetings, we can contact you and let you know. I looked at doing a, uh, a mass text to everybody It was a registered voter in Cedar City today, and it was going to cost me $212, so we didn't do that, um, but if we have your information, we can let you know of any upcoming uh, events or meetings or updates. All right, my mother always said, don't make the ones that are on time, wait for the ones that are late, so. I like that. Yeah. Uh, just so everybody knows, we do have cameras recording, so don't say anything you wouldn't want to have uh, everybody in the town see, because it's going to be put out on YouTube. Um, my name is Dan Kidder. I want to thank you all for coming here today. Um, the reason we're having this meeting is, obviously everybody knows about the events that occurred at Canyon View High School. Um, where a student came on campus with a gun. That was kind of the impetus that started this whole thing off. Um, in that process, uh, one of the school board members asked the president of the school board to call a special meeting, and he replied that he couldn't do that. And looking at state law, if 24 hours notice, uh, any body that's a public entity can call a special meeting uh, under Iowa County School Board policy only the president of the school board can call a special meeting, but he was under the impression that he could not do that. Um, so obviously there needs to be some open meeting law training for the school board. Um, a lot of conflicting information has come out, and I'm hoping that, I'm, I'm very glad that Chief Adams is here, um, and maybe he can help us get to the bottom of some of that information. Uh, one of the reports that I heard is that uh, Officer Carpenter, um, because Mr. Heaton was not on campus, told Vice Principal King that there was a student, a report of a student with a gun on campus. Is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. correct. So it was actually her call then on whether or not to shut down the school uh, at that time. Which day are you talking about? The first day or the second day? The first day, on Monday. Monday, the 27th. Yeah. It was 2 o'clock? It, that, that report was to her was around 2 o'clock. Yeah, do you want me to? Yeah, come on. Up. Yeah, fill in some of the. Might be easier then to go back and forth. <clears throat> Thank you, and, and thanks everyone for, for being here uh, tonight. Um, so, yes, do uh, you want me to go through a few details or yeah, answer questions? Is that okay? All right. So uh, the first the first contact came uh, at about 1.30. So Officer Carpenter's in his office at 1.30 p.m. when the student comes in and says, um, this individual, and because they're juveniles, we won't use their names, uh, was just leaving the parking lot. Um, it looks like he pointed a gun at me. I can't be certain uh, because he was inside of his cab. He was driving away. But I think that's what I saw. And we're running more, right? As, as more information comes forward, as students become a little bit more courageous, because they're afraid, uh, and we've learned that over time, uh, we learned that um, that there were, well, initially we, were, we had reported four were in the vehicle at the time. Two didn't see it because they were down with their, with their faces and their phones. Uh, there was another one with this individual who saw this. So he comes in, reports it. He says, this happened about an hour ago, so the event, Brandishing occurred about 12.20, 12.25 during lunch. The student comes in at 1.30 to report it. Um, and, and we learn now that because I think of fear and some of the relationships that have, have existed, uh, that he says, I just I don't want to be involved in this. He told Officer Carpenter, don't call me down from class. I don't want to be involved in this process. So uh, just keep in mind when we go through an investigation like this, we're relying on the information that the people give us. And this is not uncommon for maybe unwilling victims or unwilling participants for a variety of reasons um, that affect them in the moment. And that just makes it sometimes difficult for us, the law enforcement, to be thorough and adequate in those stages. So Officer Carpenter went in um, with the information he had, immediately started to look at the cameras and to see if he could see this vehicle that had been there an hour previous, if he could see evidence that the gun was brandished, and at that, that moment is when he talked to Mrs. King and said, hey, this is what I'm working on. Um, I don't think in that moment that Officer Carpenter felt like there was an imminent threat. He may have pushed, he very well could have pushed Mrs. King to say, I think we need to lock down. 
So I don't want to completely put that blame entirely on the district because we, I mean, we try to work hand in hand with our district partners. Um, and I'll, I'll get to some other points in a bit, but, but that communication was made. Um, as he's doing that, that's when two other students came in and said, so-and-so, a different student was just assaulted by the same individual in the parking lot. So Matt leaves what he's doing investigating the first incident, goes out to the parking lot to try to locate this second victim. Uh, can't find him initially, talks to some students. Yeah, he's over in this vehicle. He walks over, finds this other student, and the student conveys that, yes, he pulled up. He hit me in the face two or three times. There were two other kids there. Got back in the car and took off. And so maybe there, to that point. Is, is there any other information that you have First of all, that two female students also reported that they had a side profile of the gun and actually described the gun? Yeah, so, two o'clock. So that came Friday. So so at least one of those female students, again, I think over time with some more courage and prompting from family and friends, mm -hmm. came to him. I think it was actually Thursday is when they came. So it wasn't Monday. Correct. Because the report Correct. that I had was later on Monday. Nope, but that was he didn't know about that until Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Um there was another question that was coming up. That's okay. Yeah, I'm getting old. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me let me figure out what it is. Come on up to the mic just so the cameras can pick up for those who are going to watch the YouTube video if you would. I'm sure. So, when um, did they find out? Because we were told. I've heard that they, when he came back and beat the kid up, that. If there was a gun brandished at other kids yeah, at the same right. time. When? <laughs> yeah. When was that notified? So yeah. So that that came. So yeah. So that that came later in the week when students came forward. That none of that was given to Officer Carpenter in that moment. Okay. I think there was some reluctance again from all the students involved. That's why the assault victim didn't come in and report it. Were these these two female students that come in and said, "Hey, by the way, did you know that so and so was just beat up?" And there's some history there with that student as well, and, and, and we're working through that with the school district and with, with uh, law enforcement as well. So I want to be sensitive to the students and the victims of this because um, of, of what they've gone through, and quite frankly, there there is there's fear, and sometimes that that creates some reticence, you know, some hesitancy to, to report things. Yes. Can I just say that I'll just offer this suggestion because I work at Canyon View and. These kids are scared. They're scared. I wasn't scared when they locked us down. Not one bit. Felt completely safe. But to come forward and say something, it's scary because when they have the whole black face thing that happened at Walmart, some of our kids were caught on camera. They weren't even involved in this and they got drawn into it, threatened, one of our kids had to check out of school because he had his life threatened so many times because he was on camera when that whole thing happened and he didn't even know the people that were black faces. So these kids are scared. To get them to come forward in the first place is rough. And I get it. Because this kid was a good kid that had to check out of school because his life was threatened by these people and he wasn't even part of what was going on. So it's hard. I know you expect great things from these kids, but I just want you to know that I work in the office there. I feel like they did the best possible thing they can. We can all sit back like you do when you're watching a football game on TV and say, you guys are idiots, why did you make that play? You know, just things that you don't really know all of the workings. And so it's easy to sit back and criticize I would just like to tell you that I felt safe. I don't know when they should have called a lockdown. You call a lockdown early, the parents get upset. You call it too late, the parents get upset. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So it's a rough call. It's just a rough call. I just would like to say that. Okay, so what I'm gonna say and what I'm gonna ask, I want you to first of all know you have my utmost respect. And I hope that we can all respect each other as citizens and as in government employees that we entrust. <clears throat> there was a 911 call on Tuesday at 12.14 a.m. that a mother, if I'm not mistaken, had called uh, after talking with her son and had conveyed some information about what had happened Monday. 
when that officer changed duty in the morning, was there a debriefing that happened? And yes. why didn't you know about it? So two part question, right? Yeah, so the call, uh, and, and not that it matters, but it wasn't actually a 911 call. It, it was a call to our business office, which, okay. which was in route to dispatch, and it was on the recorded line. Okay. And that, that recording is available. I know there's been a few requests for that. Um, so trying to put into context that information, and this is what was conveyed to me by the officer that took it, as well as Officer Carpenter. Most of that information Officer Carpenter already knew about the, the day before. The threat to shoot at the school was new. Um, they don't notify me of every little thing. I mean, it's a big city and, and we're extremely busy. And so they, you know, in that moment, Officer Mickelson, when he took that, felt like I'm going to debrief the SROs in the morning, which he did before school started. Um, and then that was passed on to me probably an hour and a half later as things started to wrap up. And so he, he immediately notified Officer Carpenter and Officer Bergstrom, who have jurisdiction over Canyon View Middle and Canyon View High, as well as Officer Baines, who has Cedar High, and said, all three of you guys, if you can get to KMV High School, as well as the three patrol shifts, or the three patrol officers on day shift. Because he was trying to, we were trying to figure out, based on the information the day before, if we had a credible threat. And, and keep in mind, there's some history with this student and others in the county from those previous incidents, where we're trying to put things together, we're trying to obtain enough probable cause to make an arrest, and, you know, we could, and I, I'm going to acknowledge, you know, lessons learned as well as we go, go forward. We could have done that. We could have said, let's just lock it down just to be safe or cancel school. The officers just do their research and all the work they've done didn't feel like in that moment there was a credible threat, but still had resources going to school before school started to make sure that was protected. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this um, way that uh, assaulted the other kid and the, the possible potential shooter at one point. Yeah. Is a member of the gang? So they, there's about, I want to say maybe seven of them uh, between the ages of 17 and 19. Have they all been arrested at the same time he was? No, so, so the drive-by shootings, which you may have seen the press conference mm -hmm. the sheriff's office did, one occurred on the 12th, and one occurred on that night, Monday night into Tuesday morning. There were, I believe, six arrested, five adults, one juvenile, and they were arrested after leaving the drive-by shooting location. So were these the kids that were with him the second time he went out to the high school no. grounds and beat the kid? No. So there were more, more people out there that were involved with him that weren't arrested or being watched? Uh, those, came, those came later, so we were actually made arrest later that week on the others that were with him in the parking lot. Here, here, here he is, and, and believe me, I don't know more than you. All I can do is share experience sure. with you. Um, I spent from 75 to 86, 87 in Cedar City with my life, in my life. Moved down to California, spent the next 30 years in California. Victim of seven crimes while I lived there for 30 years, one of which having a gun held on me. I understand gangs. Sure. Gangs operate one for all, all for one. And it really worries me that we've got this type of student, quote unquote student, in our high schools. No matter how small you think it is, and, and believe me, they're not big boys, I know that. I have had enough experience in my life to know these kids are not big boys. I know that. I have had enough experience in my life to know these kids are not big boys. But they're acting like it. Sure, you're right. That's dangerous. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And <laughs> it's my hope and prayer that if we ever come into another situation like this and we know there's gang affiliation or good old boy affiliation or whatever, that school goes on lockdown because you see, it might have been the kid in the back seat on the right side or on the left side that came back and carried out what that boy wanted to do in the sure. first place because that's his brother. Sure. So two part question, right? Yeah, so the call, uh, and, and not that it matters, but it wasn't actually a 911 call. It, it was a call to our business office, which okay. was then routed to dispatch, and it was on a recording line. Okay. And that, that recording is available. I know there's been a few requests for that. Um, so trying to put into context that information, and this is what was conveyed to me by the officer that took it, as well as Officer Carpenter. Most of that information Officer Carpenter already knew about the, the day before. The threat to shoot at the school was new. Um, they don't notify me of every little thing. I mean, it's a big city and, and we're extremely busy. And so they, you know, in that moment, Officer Mickelson, when he took that, felt like I'm going to debrief the SROs in the morning, which he did before school started. Um, and then that was passed on to me probably, probably an hour and a half later 
as things started to ramp up. And so he, he immediately notified Officer Carpenter and Officer Bergstrom, who have jurisdiction over Canyon View Middle and Canyon View High, as well as Officer Dades, who has Cedar High, and said, all three of you guys, if you can get to Canyon View High School, as well as the three patrol shifts, or the three patrol officers on day shift. Because he was trying to, we were trying to figure out, based on the information the day before, if we had a credible threat. And, and keep in mind, there's some history with this student and others in the county from those previous incidents where we're trying to put things together, we're trying to obtain enough probable cause to make an arrest, and you know, we can, and I, I'm going to acknowledge, you know, lessons learned as well as we go, so go forward. We could have done that. We could have said, let's just lock it down just to be safe or cancel school. The officers just through their research and all the work they had done didn't feel like in that moment that there was a credible threat, but still had resources go to the school before school started to make sure that was protected. You know, if I'm not mistaken, this kid that uh, assaulted the other kid and the, and the possible potential shooter at one point yeah. is a member of a gang. So they, there's about, I want to say maybe seven of them uh, between the ages of 17 and 19. Have they all been arrested at the same time he was? No, so, so the drive-by shootings, which you may have seen the press conference the sheriff's office did, one occurred on the 12th, one occurred on that night, Monday night into Tuesday morning. There were, I believe, six arrested, five adults, one juvenile, and they were arrested after leaving the drive-by shooting location. So were these the kids that were with him the second time he went out to the high school grounds no. and beat the kid? No. So there were more, more people out there that were involved with him that weren't arrested or being watched? Uh, those came those came later, so we had actually made arrests later that week on the others that were with him in the parking lot. Here, here, here it is, and, it, and believe me, I don't know more than you. All I can do is share experience sure. with you. Um, I spent from 75 to 86, 87 in Cedar City with my life. My life. Moved down to California, spent the next 30 years in California. Times while I lived there for 30 years, one of which having a gun out on me. I understand gangs. Sure. Gangs operate one for all, all for one. And it really worries me that we've got this type of student, quote unquote student, in our high schools. No matter how small you think it is. And, and believe me, they're not big boys. I know that. I have had enough experience in my life to know these kids are not big boys. But they're acting like it. Sure. You're right. That's dangerous. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And <laughs> it's my hope and prayer that if we ever come into another situation like this and we know there's gang affiliation or good old boy affiliation or whatever, that school goes on lockdown because you see, it might have been the kid in the back seat on the right side or on the left side that came back and carried out what that boy wanted to do in the sure. first place because that's his brother. Sure, yeah. Great points, absolutely. Yeah. You. you did a great job today, by the way, on both Thank accounts. Okay. I'm very happy with it. Is there any treatment that when the suspect returned he was with three other individuals and they came out and assaulted the student and there was a gun pointed at that point as well. So, uh, part truth, yes, there were two other students with him. There was no gun, at least not reported to us, pointed in that moment. The, the report of a gun came later from the female student who said when he was assaulting the one student that she said she thought she saw the imprint of a gun in his pocket. It was never taken out. Okay. That was reported on Thursday. But nothing to validate that there was anything pointed during the assault or brandished. So, kind of the whole point of this meeting was to bring you all together. One of the board members has made the statement that really only 50 people care about this. And we got 25 here. <laughs> so maybe they're not wrong. Um, and, and it's unfortunate because I don't feel like things were handled correctly on Monday. I believe that from my training and experience, the moment gun is mentioned, you lock it down, you secure the facility, then you determine whether or not you have a credible threat. And that's what happened today. And I was really happy to see that. For those of you who don't know, um, Cedar Middle School had a stage two lockdown because some students overheard someone talking about a gun. And I had to feel that it should be kind of like when you're going through the TSA line, you don't joke about certain things. And if you do, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. Um, we also had an incident at Canyon View High School this week where a student was suspended because six other students reported that he had talked about bringing a gun to school. There's no evidence 
that what they're saying is true. If I were doing this investigation, each of those students would have been interviewed separately, looked for discrepancies in their stories um, to determine whether they're matching up or not. Uh, the parents of this child are so upset they're taking him out of school and moving, and moving back to Colorado. So one of the things I wanted to, and, and is, is Cammie here? Did Cammie come in? Me? Yeah! <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you all about was alternatives. What are the alternatives that we have to the public school system? And I was hoping Lance was going to be here. Um, Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. The advertisement for this meeting was to come and talk about the issues that we had with, with what happened. If you divert off to that other thing, that may not be why people came here. And right. I, I, I think we can, it better serves our time to address the reason we came here first, and if we want to discuss those things, that would be appropriate. Okay. That's my suggestion. Sure be. I'll take it under advisement. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, though, was what are the alternatives available to us? And one of the things that came to my mind um, before I moved here, I was the Senior Vice President of Communications for the Center for Education Reform. We worked on charter schools and we worked on school voucher programs. We sued school districts. We filed amicus briefs between the, before the Supreme Court. We even helped John Stossel put on a great thing called Stupid in America for 60 Minutes. It was a great program. I highly suggest you look it up. But one thing that popped into my head is I know that the idea of taking your kids out of the school district and homeschooling them is daunting. Time-wise, where do you start? And so one thing that just popped into my head is if there was some sort of a uh, homeschooling cooperative here in Cedar City, how many of you would be interested in being a part of a homeschooling cooperative? A couple. Okay. There is one already? Does anybody have information on that? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have you come up in a minute and, and share that information because I think people would be interested in that resource. How many people here right now feel like their children are safe in the school district? I personally don't really worry about so much of what happened this week versus more of the curriculum that's Mike, coming down the line. Go to the mic. Go to the mic. Yeah, my personal I personally don't worry as much about what happened Monday and Tuesday. More as I worry more about the curriculum that's coming down the line in public schools. Okay. okay, so my career thing is one thing is horrible, yes, but here in Cedar City, I, it doesn't, I don't carry that same fear as much. I'm more worried about the curriculum. Okay. So, Uvalde was a community about the size of Cedar City, and they didn't think that that could happen there either. I said I don't think it can't happen. Hold on, hold on, I'm not there, I'm not done yet. So there, there's one other person that I want to have come up real quick, and that's Amy. We have been engaged in providing uh, trauma therapy sessions throughout uh, all of Iron County, really, and I'm gonna have her come up and tell you a little bit about that, because she wants to go home and see her baby. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably going to go a little bit off topic, but actually from what I do and what I've been seeing over the last few months, I, I want you to know that it's not off, off topic. Um, I've been, I'm a part of a community collaboration between some nonprofit programs here in Cedar, as well as several mental health therapists, and we're, we're striving to, to glean in more. And we've been working over the last few months treating um, anybody who's been um, impacted by the death of the Hey Earl family in, in early January. Um, what I wanted to, to share real quick with all of you here tonight is that um, this collaboration, I know we're a few minute, a few months out of this now, and a lot of people are at this point now that like, we just want to be done talking about it. We don't, like, let us just put this behind us. But what we know in, in our field is it doesn't just fall away behind it. If it has impacted you, if it, impact, if it has possibly impacted 
a family member, somebody you know, we have created this collaboration to to get services where services are needed. Um, our area doesn't have enough mental health therapists for the number of people that we have despite having traumatic events happen. We know that. And so we have programs that we've built to be able to serve larger numbers and we have been utilizing those for the last several months. We've now served um, upwards of 80 people through this process, um, helping them recover. We know, that, and that was all done by word of mouth. And I know that we have more out there that need these services and we've had financial donations offered to this collaboration to help cover these services for those who cannot otherwise um, access those because of financial barriers. So I'm going to leave this flyer that I have back on the table by that signature pad that, that Dan had for everyone. Um, and if you know of anyone or, or that you think they might have been affected by this, please take however many flyers you need and hand them to them. It's got a QR code through our website that we've built. Um, on that website, it has uh, some assessments that people can take. So even if you're not sure if you are still having some effects from that at all, take the assessment. It will help you know. You'll get that score back that will help you know how is my body doing with all this? Am I still kind of, my nervous system still charged up on this? And if so, you're going to get an email from um, one of my staff that will let you know what services are available to you. We're really just trying to help everyone know that these services are there and available to you. Where I see that it ties to this in this discussion today is that watching just in general as a mental health therapist in this community, the energy has been charged. I mean, it started ramping up a few years ago, but it really, in our community, came way up in January after this tragedy happened. And in our school, in Canyon View, talking with teachers, talking with people that work there, the energy in Canyon View has been charged. It's been up. That the, I know these nervous systems of these youth, teachers, and our community are charged still without having fully recovered from this trauma that we, we experienced as an entire community in January. We want to try to help any way we can to get those nervous systems back down. So hopefully we won't continually have these incidences happening. They're more likely to happen if we're not having any recovery. And so we're trying to create that opportunity. We're doing everything we can. So these flyers are on the back table. Pass them around. And if we can offer help, we will. That's it. Thank you. Amy. All right, so all that stuff we were talking about before, that was kind of the housekeeping. housekeeping. Um, I just kind of wanted to get some numbers and I wanted to clear some things up with the chief. So let me kind of give you a breakdown of what's happened since uh, that Monday of uh, February 27th. We've done a lot of grammar requests. We haven't gotten a lot of answers. We've done a lot of research. We've looked at a lot of the policies that the school board is supposed to have and is supposed to follow and each school is supposed to follow. They don't exist. Um, under Utah state law, the school by July 1st of every year is supposed to certify, the school board is supposed to certify that all the faculty, staff have been given the training and then that training has been shared with the student and parents. And that law was passed in 2019 and that has not been done once. So we've got a grammar request out for the 911 call. Our concern with that 911 call is, my, my concern with that 911 call is probably not as severe as it is with others. Um, I want to hear the call because in my mind, if the call is, hi, uh, the kid who came to school with a gun, I think he's going to shoot up the school. I'm not doing anything on that. But if it's, I know he is going to shoot at the school because he said he is, or he's got a Facebook post on it. I'm going to react differently to that. Okay. This is really hard for me because I am that person. That you are the person. Okay. I sure am. And my son is the one that is the so-called uncooperative juvenile. And this is really, really hard for me to come out and talk to everybody because I'm not one to want to make a big deal. I don't, but I do worry about these kids. My little boy is scared out of his mind right now. I mean scared. He hasn't gone to school since. We are homeschooling him or online school. 
But I got word of this actually from my daughter, what had happened at school that day. Well, one person called me from that school to let me know that my little boy had a gun pointed at him. Um, so I get word of it and I called my son and I said, tell me what happened. He said, I was after lunch, I was at the school, this kid pulled a gun and he pulled it on me and a few of my friends and he didn't know what to do. He was terrified to go and talk to the school resource officer. Um, but he consulted with another friend of his and they called even his father to say, what would what we do? Because we don't, they were just afraid. And so he goes back to the school, he talks to Officer Carpenter and he tells him, this kid pulled a gun on me at school. What do I do? I, I'm scared. He, he gave concern and I'm sure he backpedaled some of it. I'm not saying he didn't. I mean, he was afraid. He didn't want to rat on his friends. He didn't want to be the snitch at school is what he said. Mom, I can't be the snitch. They're going to jump me. Because not only that, but one of them even went up to him and said, you're next. You are next after they beat up the other little boy. Um, so he went, he talked to the resource officer. The resource officer went out to the parking lot. And of course, it was an hour later. So naturally, there wasn't much going on out there. So then the resource officer looks at the cameras. And apparently, he was looking at the wrong time, not the correct time, um, because the conflicting information that he had at this point, which is whatever i love officer carpenter i think he does an amazing job of what how many kids he has to control but so then um the other boy gets i'm trying to be careful with his names the other boy gets jumped at school which is one of his friends and it was terrifying to him so then i get word from another group of friends that this kid is coming to school and he's going to shoot the school out and that is the exact words i used i called i said i'm afraid for my son's life i know everything is public record i know that these kids can come back because of the so-called kids that had done the drive-by shooting a week before and so and that's speculation sorry and so I didn't know what to do so I called and I talked to somebody and I said listen this is what happened at school nobody has bothered to call me from the school to let me know that my gun the gun was pointed at my kids head um, nothing was said to me at all and then I told them about I said and I have word from a reliable source that this kid is claiming to shoot the school out tomorrow in the morning so I told my daughter, I said, honey, I don't want you going to school tomorrow. I'm afraid. I am very afraid. Mom, I have all these classes. I said, you walk in those front doors and you come directly out. My son wouldn't go to school. I, the crazy part to me is that nothing was done that morning. I was never notified of any of this information. Um, and then the lockdown happens. and. I, it just has been a mess and the school never even bothered to call me the whole week my child was out of school the whole time did you have a spot on camera going no. at some point so yeah it was a it was a victim that came forward to, to report something and it's a juvenile so there's discretion used in those scenarios yeah, yeah. so i i'm a lost words for all you guys but that's what happened but i did call and i i'm glad i called but and I think our officers do a wonderful job. I'm not belittling anybody, and I love our school system. I'm not trying to put down the school. I just think that things need to change. We need to learn from this. We need to move forward. We know now what we need to do, and, and we, we just need to come together as a community and just make it happen. That parking lot is a mess. That's the biggest problem with that entire school is the parking lot. It's not in the school. It's the parking lot where it's located i mean those uh, my own son he half the time i'm like why didn't you go to class he takes naps out in people's cars mm -hmm. i'm like when i went to cedar high do you know what they used to do they used to run around and chase us get to class <laughs> get to class i'm like why is this not happening so that is my solution <laughs> to this whole problem and 1100 students for one officer that is insane uh, it's just we need to up yeah. security i mean two three it's awful and 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 the entrance i mean yeah they've shut down the back entrance but even my daughter's saying well that just keeps people from not going to school at all because they're like not going to go all the way around the building and so well that's their problem <laughs> and i'm like oh my gosh 
you guys are crazy. Anyway, so that's my two cents, but. Okay, so we, we have, so now you we don't need to have that 911 call, but we'll still, we'll still take it and listen to it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and I didn't call 911, I called dispatch. Yeah. So that's what I did, so. And I guess part of the issue is we have a lot of, of conflicting information. Once I get up and say something, my phone lights up, my emails light up. I get contacted through Facebook, through email, through telephone, and almost every person who contacts me starts off by saying, please don't share my name. <laughs> and it makes my job really hard, especially since it's a job I don't get paid for. This is all free. You know? So, real quick, um, so we've, we've made grammar requests for that 911 call. We've also made grammar requests for the school policies. We got one. My girlfriend's going to come up and share some of the interesting things that are in that and some of the things that aren't in that. Um, and it's kind of humorous. Um, but I also want to take a moment to apologize. Um, on Wednesday at the city council meeting, I got a little hot under the collar. And I aimed my frustration at the wrong person. Um, Superintendent Hatch has been here for just about a year. Um, he is not the, the cause of all of the many, many, many issues that we are facing and we have right now. And for me to unload on him and shake my finger at him and, and you know, how dare you to him, um, that was me venting my frustrations. And if he ever sees this, I want to apologize for that. That was aimed at the wrong person. So, all right. You've been waiting for, no, this gentleman back here has been waiting quite a while. <laughs> Come on up. <clears throat> well, first off, uh, Dan, thank you for putting this on, and Chief, thank you for showing up. How is that not a credible threat? Um, I heard you said earlier, Chief, if we had a credible threat, I don't know what is, and I don't know what the threshold is uh, for a credible threat. <clears throat> Today, Cedar Middle is locked down, apparently, with a credible threat. Um, and so I just was curious, Chief, if you can answer what, what meets the threshold for a lockdown in your guys' eyes. I know it's up to the school, but what meets that threshold? Sure. So, I mean, honestly, it, you can imagine every case may be nuanced differently. Sure. Um, today was a little bit different uh, in that we had, and I want to be sensitive, and I wasn't going to say anything to Kelly because I knew she was here. I wanted to be sensitive to her and her son. Um, we have the student today, for example, and, and, and it doesn't vary by much. He comes forward, he says, this is what I heard, um, and he's in the office talking. When I got there, uh, the, the sergeant for the, over the SROs comes out and says, he says he heard this, but he has no idea who it is. So he, he heard it by, from some student in the hallway, and he cannot identify him whatsoever. So then the question becomes, so we're already on lockdown, right, because the threat's been made. How do we proceed? Do we say, well, we've determined it's not credible because we have no suspect. We have, I don't know how many kids Cedar Middle School has, but we have all these, these kids we're going to have to question. Or do we go through every class and keep it on lockdown, which we could, for half the day and search every single backpack. And so when they come out and said that, I said, well, go in and let's slow this down just a little bit. Question this kid a little bit more. He's probably nervous. Let's let him calm just a bit and, and ask more pointed questions. They did that. He said, there were three kids behind me as I replanted my mind. One of them said, I've, he thought he heard a gun in my backpack. So they go to the cameras. They are able to determine who these kids are. And they pull them out of class. They bring them in, search the backpacks. There's nothing there. They were surprised by that. One kid said, I made a comment about an empty thing of gum in my backpack. I don't know if that's what it, what it was. So that flipped, right? And, and we determined in that moment, okay, it was good. Um, again, there's, there was a lot of, I, I try to trust my officers in, in their investigation, what they determined in the moment. That information, again, was passed on from Officer Mickelson, from Kelly to Officer Carpenter. And, and he went with the information he had in the moment, the preceding issues as well, and then counseled with other officers. Um, Keep <clears throat> So it's my understanding that the uh, school is ultimately responsible for making the call for a lockdown. Is that, that's... Yeah, so, so Vice Principal was notified immediately... And referring to the 27th. Yep, yep. yep, immediately after the 27th incident. And then she, my understanding was she passed it on to the principal. 
And then as Officer Carpenter was investigating the assault is when he had, had communicated with the principal. He was off campus, I think, for an appointment at that time. So they communicated by phone as he was investigating the how assault. Far, how long after the, the second incident? Uh, so we see a gun, right. hour passes, then he comes back. Yep. And the assault. And the assault happens. Yep. So How long the, after that incident was the principal? It was during the assault the investigation when he communicated with the principal. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then at that time, it, it was determined that they were going to confront this kid in the morning. Yeah, so, so Officer Governor said they met, yeah. they talked with her mother. She couldn't come in at that moment because of a previous incident that happened two weeks prior. Mm -hmm. The principal said, we need to discuss this more in depth. We need to figure out what's going on here. And so the decision collectively was made for in the morning to be able to sit down and, and investigate and interview this, this young man. Okay, but at that point, it still was not a credible threat to, to notify schools, parents. And I know that's not completely on you guys, sure. that's on the school. But at that point, everything was deemed safe for the community, essentially. Yes, okay. from our perspective, yes. From your perspective. Now, um, I, I can't have you speak on the, the school district's policy. Maybe you're aware, Dan, I know you mentioned that you have some school district policy. But what is the police department's policy on active incidents, active shooter is there is there a threshold to where you you do notify um, again kind of going back to the do you uh, do you recommend lockdowns what is the threshold for notification like when do you find out as, as the police chief yeah so it varies I mean it honestly depends on is it active is it serious um, and the officers will notify their supervisors and then they'll bring that up to me we don't have a specific flow chart that says for every single incident this is this is what happens but there is, there is a notification though if something but there is there is a notification though if something was to happen involving a gun at some point you're going to find out about that yeah. yes and when did you first find out about it tuesday morning which was the some early tuesday morning the 28th the 28th yeah okay um, that's all i have now i know you were kind of going down chronologically sure. so that was my questions sure. up to that point and maybe i'll have some more but uh, yeah I'll let, have this gentleman come up, then I'll have Pandora come up. Then I have Pandora mm -hmm. come up. Mm -hmm. up here. Yeah. Come up here. No, Pandora. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well yeah. 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 I moved here to Cedar City about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. Um, I've been on both sides of all of this that's gone on. I do not mean to minimize the incident nor the feelings of any parent or student or teacher or school um, worker, employee. Um, my high school experience was that I was a Los Angeles County a principal and vice principal. We did a lot of training with the LA County Sheriff Department. We had a uh, assignment uh, deputy assigned to our school at high school. Now, you have to understand the high schools are much larger in California. I think at the school I worked at, there was nearly 4,000 students. Uh, we did have uh, campus security. We called them campus supervisors. And uh, that was a big help. That was a big help. I'm just going to throw out a few incidents for you to realize and understand that incidents like this happen in Los Angeles County Schools nearly on a daily basis where you have to make a decision as an administrator about involving the police, and interviewing the students, contacting parents, or even walking down the schools. It's not a pleasant responsibility when you realize you have the safety of the students involved in any, whatever decision you have to make. And timing is of the utmost importance. Um, I, I think with this incident, there's, there's a lot of what ifs and a lot of fears out there. And Believe me, I, I, I had that happen to me too as a parent because when my daughter was a student at Palmdale High as a sophomore, one of her good friends was stabbed 11 times with an ice pick. It happens. It was traumatic. 
to say the least. I also know that we had lockdowns one time, three days in a row. Schools getting involved, blown up. Kids are out in the field, and we're, you know, we're trying to deal with all that. But in the meantime, we had evacuated all the buildings. We had the, the uh, police officers come. We even had, um, what do you call it, drug sniffing dogs come to the school and bomb sniffing dogs. Um, and so what I'm saying is that I think we need to develop a trust in our law enforcement and in our school administrators to know that they're making a decision uh, important enough to procure the safety of our students. Now in California, I'm sure this is probably true here in Cedar City, I haven't delved into it, but we were required to have a safe school plan every year updated and it was it ran through the parent advisory committee or whatnot and it was approved by the fire marshal and uh, the sheriff department so that we had a, a procedures in place to, to you know if we had this or we had that egress ingress all that kind of stuff for the schools and it's important to have that stuff in place but you can't second guess and have a policy for every little thing. I tell my dad, my daughter came home with this tale about her friend getting stabbed with an ice pick. I thought that that just doesn't happen, you know, doesn't happen. But it happened. I also was at school one day and uh, there was a lockdown in process. And uh, what was the issue? I was trying to figure out how, how this is. Meanwhile, we, we had campus, uh, we had sheriff's department people all over the campus, and what's going on? And I, you know, at that point, I was a vice principal, and I said, I don't understand why, what's this going on? Oh, we had a parent call in that there was a gun at school. Okay, did they give any detail? No. Well, the security called the deputies. They secured the school by by a lockdown. Then, as we started investigating the situation, I, I realized that the student they thought was the suspect was a a, a kid who had been in school maybe less than a week. A week. Now, he didn't speak English. Did not speak Spanish. He spoke uh, che. It was a Guatemalan dialect. He came to school and they said he had a gun. Well, in, in the clue of the investigation, I realized that I was probably the one responsible for what had happened because my wife was a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, and uh, she had given me materials for this kid to learn English. And part of that was I had given him some, you know, Crayola magic markers or whatever they were. Because he was learning colors, he'd never been to school. He was almost 18 years old, but he'd never been to school. So we were trying to help him. The long and the short was that uh, I told him to take these home and color these pictures. When he got on the bus, one of the kids in the school said, there's a deputy right out here by the bus stop. So you better ditch those, mar those markers because they'll think you're some kind of a tagger and you'll get pulled over by the police. So he hit him in the bushes. Here's the credible threat. Some parents saw him going to the bus stop, dropping their kid off at the bus stop. They saw him going into the bushes and pulling something out of the bushes and putting it in his backpack. The parent called in and said they thought they had a gun. Now, what I'm not, I don't want to sec, uh, second guess the parent. That was okay. But it, it really wasn't a gun. It was the markers that I had given that kid. And, that, and so I, I felt somewhat responsible for that because the kid didn't know and nobody else knew. And the kid didn't speak English, he didn't speak Spanish. It was very difficult to determine. The reason I'm saying all of this is because in every incident, it's, it's extremely difficult to try to make a split second decision about what to do. I'm in favor of, if, if there's something like that out there, the lockdown works, it helps. And we had to have a serious talk then with all of the students about not only their fears and their what ifs, but what to do, how to report, uh, and, and 
and believe me, it's, it's not easy for the kids to be able to come forward and report that one of their peers is either drunk at school, on drugs, has a weapon, or whatnot. I picked up guns off of school. I picked up guns off of school. I picked up people that's on the floor convulsing from drugs. Um, and, and BS parents, it, it happens. It's going to happen in Cedar City, too. I've noticed gang activity here in Cedar. I've seen graffiti. Uh, I could probably would walk around a school and determine where all this is happening, because there are, there are signs that people can look for. Like I said, we've been trained to look for um, gang activity, where kids hang out, what groups of kids hang out, what groups of kids are contradicting each other, Look for pencil marks, markings on paper, backpacks, even the type of clothing that kids wear. That's all important. That all says something. But I'm here to say I think we need to have some trust in our law enforcement and in our school administrators. They're making the best decisions they can, often like that. Um, and like I say, I, I understand the fears because that, this happened even in my own family with my daughter. But at the same time, um, being a school administrator, I was concerned. I remember one time they were doing construction at, at one of the schools, and they put up um, fencing. They put up razor wire at the top of all this fencing. Now, I, was, I worked at the last school district, and yet I was the one who went to the principal and said, you need to take that down. This isn't a prison. It, we, I don't want to instill fear in the kids about what's going on inside here. But I, I've seen everything from suicides at school to shootings. And it's, it's not a fun thing. But it is a difficult situation, not just for the administrators and the school police, but it, for the parents and the students. And I'm just saying that I don't think we can develop one policy that's going to take care of it all. We're just going to have to learn to deal with things and to teach our kids to be resilient in the face of danger. Thank you. Thank you. So that all being said, there's a lot of things that the school district is supposed to be doing that they're not doing, and Pandora is going to come up and share some of those. Okay. Can anybody guess what the school's policy is in a situation like this? They have nothing. There is no policy whatsoever for this. It's very interesting. So when I originally went. Okay, so here we go. We're going to exactly how But when I originally went um, and started looking this up, they had a very vague bomb threat policy that might have covered some of this, which they have now changed where you're no longer allowed to see the bomb threat policy, by the way. <laughs> Found that out today. But it, you, know, you might have been able to construe it a little bit into this. Now they have no policy. Let me read to you the new policy that they just put up recently, I don't know, I just found it today, and it's different than what I originally found. So let's meet the school. So this is not necessarily, you know, an active shooter. I haven't been able to find anything on an active shooter. I was able to get the high school's, what do we call it? Their um, plan they're supposed to have every year. Is anyone get a copy of that? What they have for active shooters is a list of questions, no answers, L. And this they were supposed to have posted for us every year to get feedback on. I don't know how long it's been like that. My guess is they've never had a policy on active shooters. But let me read to you what they have for threats made to the school. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, let me back, back up. The responsibility for these policies is the board, uh, the school board. The school board has chosen in their policies here to delegate this to the principals, which I agree with, because I think every school probably needs a slightly different policy based on you know, the situations. So that makes sense. But it's up the high schools in order to figure that out. And I think that's part of why you're going to have heard about different procedures happening at the middle school today than you've heard about happening at the high school. OK, so it says, in the event that, the, that a phone call or other notice is received indicating something of a dangerous nature is going to happen in the school, the school should refer to their emergency operation plan. That's what I was just referring to. The plan includes the following procedures, which have been developed in cooperation with local police and fire officials and will be followed by the person receiving the threat. Notify immediately. 
Police, who will notify the fire department. Principal of the threatened school. The person receiving the threat by phone will note the exact time the call and attempt to get a voice description of the caller, age, sex, identifying patterns of speech, etc. Police and fire department emergency vehicles will respond. The senior police officer present and the building principal or designated school official will determine what procedure to follow that they may they may order they may order the building evacuated and implement such by means of a fire drill. The police and designated school personnel will conduct a search of the premises under the direction of the senior police officer. Students may return to the building only upon order of the senior police officer. The investigation of the event will be conducted by the police. So, their policy is do nothing until the police arrive. Just call the police, have a little discussion, and then decide if maybe we should evacuate. There, <laughs> I think maybe you can see the problem with this. There needs to be a policy on when to lock down the schools and when not to. So one of the problems that we run into with the school board and this high school in particular is that they keep doing whatever the police tell them to do, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that's a great organization to listen to. The problem is that there are decisions that need to be made immediately, like he was talking about, and they've <clears throat> got to have some sort of guidance and principles on what to do in that situation. So for example, let's say one of the administrators have been out and seen the event. At that point, what do they do? Do they leave the kids, go inside, and is she in a lockdown? I mean, there kids out there. <laughs> do they stay out there, putting themselves in danger, and go tell the kids to go inside? Are they not allowed to approach, and they have to just sit there and watch? I'm not saying that I know the answer to that at all, but I think that's a discussion that needs to be had. And <laughs> she's administrating the need to, to have some direction themselves. They're going to be putting themselves into bad positions where they don't necessarily have the police right there telling them what to do. And <laughs> I, so it appears so far that what they're doing is they're, they're leaning on these lockdowns. And they're saying, well, the procedures are the lockdowns. The problem is the procedures are, the lockdowns are not a policy. The lockdowns are a procedure that are supposed to be inserted into your policy. And they don't have that. They don't have any idea at this point when to use these lockdowns. So what I found interesting too is that the um, plan that they gave us not only did not have the uh, procedures for an active shooter or the threats of a shooter or anything like that, but it had three pages on how to respond to media. <laughs> I was like, I think the priorities are just a little out of whack here. Um, so technically it's the principal who's supposed to be writing these policies. Um, and he has not done that. Superintendent, of course, should have been overseeing that. And you know, he's only been here and here, like we said, I get it. Uh, and the board does have the power. So one of the things that when we've talked to the board about this, they say, we don't have the power to get into the daily events of the um, school districts, or the, the actual schools themselves. So if we go to the Utah State Code, and the Utah State Code is different than the state board. The state board is not law when they put in a policy. It is strong advisement. And so we can't actually hold them to state board regulations that they have. But the code is written by the legislator, and we can't hold them to that. So. According to the state code, a local, so this is 53G-4-402-15, subsection A. A local school board shall make and enforce policies, notice some forces in there, necessary for the control and management of the school districts. They have every right to be in the school districts and making sure this is done. On top of it, they are required by the code uh, in order for them to create these yearly plans. And they decided to delegate that to the principal, so they have every right to be enforcing this with the principals. Now, Read 18D. 18D? Okay, 18D is a fun one. A local school board shall by July 1st of each year certify to the state board that this plan has been practiced at the school level and presented to and reviewed by teachers, administrators, students, and the parents and local law enforcement and public safety representatives. 
They've been very active about law enforcement, which is great, but they have not been involving the rest of us. And this is where we as parents need to step up and start putting pressure on the board to do their job. For just a moment, sure. just as a point of clarification, mm -hmm. um, I, it, this is Stephanie Hill, and I'm on the school board. It was not my intention to speak today, but you brought up something that is critical, the idea that the school board shall by July 4, 1st of each year certify to the state board that its plan has been practiced at the school level, presented, reviewed by teachers, administrators, students, parents, local law enforcement, public safety representatives, just to to um, refresh you again. I um, have questioned the board, the board president, superintendent about that. It was last Friday that I received a call from board president um, Ben Johnson um, because I have been in attendance um, at nearly every meeting in the last year. And then if I wasn't in personal attendance the previous year, I watched most of them. I can't remember seeing that reviewed. Um, president Johnson um, identified for me that it's the the schools that set up their own plans and that in fact they've been submitted i've never seen those and he but he did tell me that they that he would send them to me i, I still yet to see them for obvious reasons i mean there have been a few other things going on but i felt it was pertinent that i had asked that question specifically and i did get a specific response i i'm i haven't seen any of those plans but i just want you to know that that there is communication and apparently there's something I don't know what it is but there's something and we will I and I'm sure that we'll all be invested as we review and update those but I felt like I had to interject that because it it just cropped up thank you thank you Stephanie, thank you, Stephanie. and I do appreciate how willing Stephanie has been to work with us I did actually get the certification that was sent in from the school what was interesting about it is it was done by law enforcement not the school board and so I need to look a little bit more into that. It could be they delegated it to the school board. The other question, though, is when was it given to the parents for them to review? And that, that's where... Longer well, good question. Yeah. I, I, I'm putting grammar requests. So part of this grammar request right about this was asking to the dates that it had been reviewed, and they didn't send that portion. So I'm going back to them and asking them to relook at that and send it to me. Um, the, the other part of this is that when we originally took a look at this and um, I pulled up the policy that we kind of had, which was kind of a bomb threat and stuff, there were policies on how the principal is supposed to notify uh, the superintendent. Part of the law is actually that they are supposed to be coming up with a communication plan for the parents. None of the parents were, were in communication. I mean, there's just there's violation after violation of the state law here. And there is a place where we can report them to the state I, I don't know how effective it will be. <laughs> We're going to find out, depending on how the meeting goes next week. So I'm a CPA. I'm a tax accountant and stuff. I've made plenty of mistakes. I understand making mistakes. But the best thing you can do is you can own up to those mistakes. You know, let them know, I'm sorry. This is where we screwed up. This is how we're fixing it. One of my big concerns with this board is they have not done that, and they will not do that. They came into the city council meeting and said that we should be celebrating. The superintendent did because we did an amazing job. The police did amaz an amazing job, and they were writing on those curb deals. And that is so offensive to me as a parent, where I'm looking at this going, whoa, 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 whoa. And so, and then it's been step after step. So I've emailed the board, um, haven't gotten the best response. Stephanie's been very responsive, which has been nice. Um, ben Johnson, I asked him about a special meeting. He didn't answer at first. I had to email him again and say, I'm still waiting on that. Um, he came back, didn't answer the question, just said, oh, we've had these press releases and stuff. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, I had to email him again and say, well, that's great, but he didn't answer my question. And he basically just refused and said, you know, there's, there's not enough parents who care. Cool. And then, then he scheduled the special meeting the next day, which was nice. <laughs> you know, I'm glad he did. I'm not sure exactly what changed his response there. But anyway, so we have more grammar requests going out where I want to know the dates that these were practiced like they were supposed to according to the law, um, not just the, the lockdown procedures. You know, I have a theory that maybe that's what their county is the lockdown procedures, but that they have no idea, like I said, when to use them. Um, let's see, one more thing. So Principal Hatch is really the one who was responsible. One of the things that I was hoping the board would do in order, I'm sorry, Eaton's, Principal Eaton. Um, 
one of the things I was hoping the board would do is show that they are serious about looking into it by you know, putting him on administrative leave, which does not mean that he did something wrong, but it does um, actually show that they're looking into what he did because he found out about it that day. He was required by the policies at the time to notify the superintendent. I don't believe he notified the superintendent until the next day. <laughs> they should have been you know, looking at what their policies were for when to lock down the school. They found out the next morning before school started that about the threat. Um, still had school, still didn't notify any parents. It, you know, the entire thing is kind of been washed up and he never made the plan in the first place. <laughs> you gotta have a basic plan. There will always be nuances, but there's gotta be a basic plan. And according to their policies and procedures for their employment officials, they do have the ability to do that. There are quite a few reasons that they are allowed to not only put them on administrative leave, but actually look um, at terminating them. One of the found, so one of the more serious ones would be the incompetence, lacking the ability to effectively execute job duties. When you are a school principal and you don't know what the policies are if you see someone with a gun, that right there should tip you off that maybe you need to look up that policy or figure out what to do. You should be practiced, you should be trained, you should know what you're doing. And anybody who's in administration should have known that already. Um, and so they should have known that there was no plan. So to me, that's also putting our kids in danger right away. Uh, failure to maintain an effective working relationship or maintain a good rapport with parents, co-workers, community, or colleges. I think he's having a hard time with that, and so we should have done it for that. Failure to fulfill the duties and responsibilities is a violation of work. He did not do that because we do not have policies or procedures for this. And so I would have hoped that they would have investigated it and at least put it on his record that, hey, he's had some serious violations here. Okay, I'm not saying we should necessarily fire him. I don't think it was just his fault. I think there was, it was basically the entire school district's fault because this is something that should have been found at every level. And you know, all the school officials should have had an idea of what the policies were, but there was no policy for them to actually follow. Okay, did you have a question for me or you just I, I was going to make some comments. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you. Though. No, I'm good. Any questions? So I'm a, I'm a parent and in the community. I'm also a teacher at Canyon View. Um, and we're, we're transplants here. We moved here maybe eight years ago because this is a great community. Am I close enough? So I'm, I'm used to speaking to the room. So we can keep it <laughs> But this is a good community. And we came from some rougher schools. But the level of policies they had were a lot stricter. And the concern that I've had, and I'm, I'm not a spokesman for Canyon View, but I talked to a lot of faculty and a lot of students. And the rumors we got from this within hours, it, I mean, it almost seems like more details, no offense, than what the police had. I mean, these kids are open book to us a lot of times. But there's a lot of preemptive issues that were concerns that I hope we can go forward with. So like, a couple things that weren't addressed that hasn't been asked is what are the kids doing? This 12, lunch ends at 1215. Kids shouldn't have been out there. There's kids out there all the time. So good thing is, if you're, if you're, how many of you are parents? I'm just curious. Is it most of you parents? If your kids are in class, they're probably OK, because that's where we are. You're, there's a teacher in the room. But things like the parking lot, the halls, that's where we find concerns. And there's all. I'll get in trouble for saying this, there's almost no truancy or tardy policy. And that's very preemptive to this kind of stuff because you can drive through the parking lot any given day, I've gone out there to go to a meeting or something, and I'll find a dozen kids in their cars or just hanging Baby. around. Baby, we've already gotten a report. Right. Well, I, I didn't want to bring, I don't want to bring, want to bring that up, but that was never mentioned. You know, the one with the curtain around the windows. Right. <laughs> You know, when, oh, I've heard all sorts of rumors of different cars that might be doing all sorts of stuff. But as teachers, it's frustrating because we can't monitor the parking lot. And some of the hallway we can buy a room, and teachers are very good about being out in the halls, but there's nooks and crannies in that building where we don't know, and trouble like this breeds there because there's no supervision. And it sounds like a lot of job for one officer to cover, but there's really time in the morning, transition at lunch, and since I've been at Canyon View, we've increased from, I mean, they added an athletic director shortly before I got there. 
We've added a dean. We have an instructional coach. Our administrative staff has tripled, it feels like. Mm -hmm. But we don't see them. The visibility is low. We don't see the officer that much. So there's no hall monitors. The, the teacher, you know, I monitor. I, I keep my pond clean is what I say. I can't get all the salt out of the ocean. So most teachers can see their hall. Our dean of students actually does walk the halls. I and mean, I can tell you, I've worked at that school for 20 years. And the halls are better since we got a dean of students. Now, I just have to say that because it frustrated the life out of me to walk down the halls and see so many students just hanging. And so since she's been there, it really has, she has helped a lot with that. They, those kids know she's coming, she drives them in the, in the, in the. How about the parking lot? There's no monitoring. The parking lot's a mess. It, it is pretty rough. Well. It's already an absent of two policies. Well, the, and what, the last two. And what we get, and what's compounding with that is, so the building has a lot of access points. Now the previous one was that you came in the front door and you checked in the office. If you were caught without a visitor, pass. Well, I see, I mean, adults, come in. I mean, you could slip in the back door and go knock on the teacher's door and pull your kid out of class. I mean, they have decided to lock down that, which is interesting because all the doors have already said these doors to remain locked all day. And they put a new sign that says the exact same thing. And now they're enforcing it, but the problem we have now is the kids have to all go through one point of entry, which is fine, but the urgency to do that's low. Tardies aren't enforced, so if, why bother or show up late? So it's just, it's fostering more issues. It's, I have a question. It's, it's hard to get the culture to change, to fit the policy, but it needs to, because we have these ongoing problems that are just, it's just brewing more trouble. You said that, and it, my daughter goes to Kennedy, and she always says the thing that they do now, so we lock the doors, that's great, but you have students that are leaving class and they're propping those doors open with rocks. So it doesn't matter that they're locked. The students are letting people in. Yeah. So my question is, is why isn't like Carpenter walking? Like I just have a job, I manage a hotel. So I have to do property walks throughout the day, make sure guests are causing a scene, you know, checking cars, like I have to do property walks. Why is our schools not getting that? Like walking around, checking the cars, like what goes on in those parking lots is, it's a lot, it's a lot. So that's my question, like, cause we can lock the doors, but if our kids are letting them in, it doesn't really do anything, you know? So it goes back to we also do need more manpower. You know, Carpenter's one person. I like Carpenter. I dealt with Carpenter. He's great, but he's only one person. He can only do so much in a hotel. So I have to do property walks throughout the day to make sure guests are causing the scene, you know, checking cars. Like, I have to do property walks. Why is our schools not giving that? Like, walking around checking the cars like what goes on in those parking lots is it's a lot it's a lot so that's my question like because we can lock the doors but if our kids are letting them in it doesn't really do anything you know so it goes back to the also need more manpower you know carpenter's one person i like carpenter i dealt with carpenter he's great but he's only one person he can only do so much, you know. So about a week after all of these events happened, the police department and the superintendent and some members of the board got together, some other staffers, and out of that came a list of uh, suggestions and steps that they're going to take in the future. And all of the, the steps to take in the future were taken directly from the state model emergency management plan, the Department of Justice uh, School Safety Program, and the Hanover Research Foundation's uh, interviews with the frontline workers in some of the biggest schools in the country who are responsible for school safety. One of those was to hire a district-wide person to be responsible for all, doing all this. All the stuff that hasn't been done, they're going to hire somebody for it. The other steps mainly were physical security steps that involved equipment. Equipment that's going to cost a lot of money, um, which would be the source of or the cause of the future bond, and is, I think is how that was worded in the document. Um, steps like building vestibules where students have to enter, and so it's kind of like a, uh, what's the term in the jail? Sally Port? Yeah, <laughs> single point of entry. Yeah, you got to go through one door and out another door, and. and uh, 
I funnels everybody through. I, I'm very good friends with a gentleman who is um, a consultant now. He used to be a federal employee, but he's now a consultant for the Department of Defense and Central Intelligence Agency, uh, the FBI, uh, Department of Justice. Um, his, his name is Steve Trelawney. And Steve is a former CIA security officer, Department of Defense security officer, and his whole world is perimeter security, and he has a program called Prefense, Preventative Defense. And it talks about hardening um, targets to make them less desirable and to make them harder to penetrate. And he has a lot of really good resources available to that. Um, his key idea is if we make it hard enough, nobody wants to attack it. That's why most of the attacks that happen in this country happen in gun-free zones. There's the inability for people to defend themselves. Um, one of the concepts that's out there and has been out there for a very long time is that unarmed security guards at a school just become the first victim. They can't defend themselves. They just become the first person to get killed. Uh, I love that in Utah, we have the ability for all teachers to be armed, janitors to be armed so long as they have a concealed carry permit. Yeah. So, and I've made those classes available to anybody who works in the school district for free. No, did that come through? No. No? I, I have another comment from just being in the school. Um, the lockdown situation, uh, again, I don't speak for all the teachers, but do you guys really know the difference between like a level one? Yeah. Level no, one but I've been asking so, that. Somebody let me just say like a level them, one is a, know. And, the, and this is, it's just a simple announcement. So someone is saying, what happens if the principal's out there? They radio it in. And a level one just means we lock our doors. Yeah. I keep teaching. And all the exterior And the kids can, the exterior doors. But the kids still go to the bathroom. They, no one in or out of the building. Which honestly, I feel like school should just be in all the time anyway. It doesn't disrupt us. So if there's a false alarm, even as teachers, mm -hmm. I go check my door and keep teaching. I mean, I don't even break my sentence. Right. Level two's the same, but the kids don't go in and out of the room. But I still keep teaching. So a kid might have to hold it. So yeah. I mean, even a level two false alarm is very minimal disruption of the school day. These aren't like the bomb drills under your desk. This is just, I make sure my door's locked. And level one, just no one out of the building. Two, no one out of the classroom. Three is where we, you know, we duck and hide. But that's got to be escalated quite a bit. So if we had a level one false alarm eight times a day, I would rather put up with that than see a tragedy. It's completely non-disruptive. And, non -disruptive. and, the dis and it's non-disruptive, yeah. so. And, and, and that was, I think, many people's, people's biggest problem and that with what happened Monday was that it's not disruptive. And now it was had to come from anyone on high. The principal could just go, let's go level one to be safe. Yeah. I, I understand that it was close to the, the time that school was going to get out, and so I know that was a consideration. Um, but looking at going forward, some of these recommendations that were made are good recommendations. These are things that should have been done in many cases. Some of the schools should have been retrofitted for that, but new construction should be definitely in place. There should be fire doors that limit access to certain individuals with magnetic key cards that the police and staff can bypass those sections. Um, but one of the ideas that comes out of the Department of Justice best practices is having the ability from a centralized location to limit access to the rest of the place. So you get somebody who's going on a shooting rampage, you lock them in one spot. They can't get out of that and can spread to the school. They can contain them in that area. Um, and that can be done with the flip of a switch, every magnetic door lock in the building goes, and every door locks and closes. And, and so in new construction, that should not be that big of a deal. And in retrofitting, that would be a big deal. Real quick before Duncan gets up, I just want to go over one more thing. The superintendent has been in communication with board members and telling them that this is not their lane. Telling them that investigating the principal is not their lane. And he's wrong. As a taxing entity of elected individuals, they are ultimately responsible for everything that happens in this school district. Yeah, the superintendent is the CEO. But he answers to the board of directors. And that board of directors answers to us, the voters. So 
Mr. Hatch is wrong. It is the school board's duty to look into this to see if everything was done properly. Now, we have many new school board members. We went from five to seven. Five to seven. So we have two new seats. We have several new school board members. So we don't blame them for I mean, Some of them have been there since January. Okay. But what happens next, but going forward, we're looking to you. We're expecting to see the school board doing their job and holding the people responsible to speak to the fire and taking the best practices that are out there for everybody to see and creating these policies, positions, flowcharts, make flowcharts, I don't care. There's tons of flowcharts in the Department of Justice and school safety, schoolsafety.gov. Okay. Very well. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Milton McClelland. I'm a, a parent of kids who go to Canyonview, or at least one of them's graduated. The other one still goes there. Um, I'm a mental health counselor, and I get a lot of kids from Canyonview, so I'm pretty connected with that community. Um, we spend a lot of time volunteering at Canyonview. Um, our kids are in the, the drama department, and we're there as often as we can for everything we can. We love Canyonview. There's a lot of great things that happen at Canyonview. This was not one of them. And I want to approach it from this standpoint. Here's some facts that we know. This event happened Monday. The police took care of their part that they needed to take care of Tuesday morning, which we understand. Tuesday night, I happened to be at school board meeting. Um, Principal Heaton was there as well. The announcement of all of this happening was posted Tuesday night at around 8 o'clock, I think. And I, you don't have it? Yeah. Give it to you. Come on, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> Darren's my neighbor. I haven't even had a chance to talk to him about this stuff yet. Um, and every single school board member and Dr. Hatch and apparently the rest of the district was sideswiped with this information. So not only did Mr. Heat not inform the parents, he didn't inform his superiors. That means that for two days this information was there, a day and a half, and we didn't know. Now, here's what I want to say. Because we have been asking these questions for two weeks now, we had a very successful event today, didn't we? I don't think anyone can say that what happened today was bad. If they do, oh well. There's always going to be outliers. The vast majority of people feel good about what happened today. Even better that there wasn't a gun presence. That happened because we asked these questions. That happened because good people stood up to ask good questions. And I feel like I have to stand up a little bit for Richard Jensen because he's not here this week. And he made me the, one of the moderators of his, of his web, Facebook page. His questions have led to these discussions. The, the communication that's potentially coming out, we'll find out. But there's a grammar request in for it that was said to the school board member. I don't want to speak on that until I've actually had it and, and can formulate an opinion on it. The facts that we know are not good. There was a lack of leadership had at Canyon View High School. I have lots of issues with the leadership at Canyon View High School because I work with the kids who get bullied there. I work with the kids who have been through awful situations. And there's other information that's probably going to come out soon that I'm not happy about. When you have a leader, and, and, this, is, and, and this is the contrast. Chief Adams and I have worked together for a long time. Um, I've, I've helped out with the CIT training when I was working at Southwest. Um, we've had a great relationship, and then he moved into my neighborhood because he knew I was there, um, clearly. I think it was for me. It was for you. I had to watch him. Chief Adams has always stood up and took the heat. I've had multiple. Um, I've been on a, a suicide call with, with, with one of my clients that Chief Adams was present at. Um, Security had to be called, police had to be called to Southwest for an unruly client, where I happened to be involved in the holding the client down, which is never fun. Um, and any time I've had a question, he's never not answered. And he's always heard me. 
We have not heard one word from Principal Heaton. Not one. That is not leadership. That is a failure of leadership. And that needs to be addressed. And the board, and I've already pressured my board member, and I've pressured other board members to address this. They may not have the right to enforce human resource policy. That may be the case. Principal Heaton may absolutely deserves to have his hearing and whatever happens. But the board members are the people we get to talk to. They're the people we get to pressure. And even if they can't investigate, they can pressure the school district to do it. So ask questions. Continue to be the minority that speaks up so that we can get the results that we want. We are not going to solve every problem. I work with people who try to kill themselves every day. They don't try to kill themselves every day. I work with them every day. <laughs> Two of my clients have successfully completed suicide. It's not a fun day. Every time that has happened, we have always met to say, what didn't work? Where could we have done something different? Because it's on me. I've got to face that question. When I fail anything I do, I have an oversight board. The state of Utah comes in and tells me all the time when they don't agree with something I do. It's called double. If I don't answer to them properly, they pull my license. There's no double for Mr. Heaton except for us. We need to be that. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of stuff that's going to be coming after us and through the grammar requests that we're doing. Um, and, and no one's right. There's some stuff that's going to get fixed only because parents stood up and made their voices heard and asked the questions and came forward with the information. I just wish when you all would send me information, you'd let me use your name because it would really make it a lot easier. But the first thing on everything I get is please don't use my name because I'm afraid of retaliation. How does that speak to the spirit of our school system when people are afraid to stand up for fear of retaliation? Well, it's a real thing. We know a student who was going to be kicked out the day after her mom got up and spoke in city council <laughs> by Mr. Eaton. So. No. No. Oh, we've looked into it. Careful yeah. making statements like that. We've yeah. looked into it very carefully. I'm the mother. <laughs> I'm the mother. I'll just say it. I'm actually the mother of the daughter that actually was attempted, kicked out the next day, actually. Actually, all her classes dropped, and, yep. and I wasn't informed. She let me know. So, didn't that actually is true. Attendance step in and got her put back in, but that's yes. what it took. Yes, that is actually. She's still a she's still a student, um, with the help of Mr. Hatch. But had I not Mr. Like had Mr. Hatch, like she would have been gone. Like, and none of the appropriate policies to get her out were followed. And they actually have a cool fun book too. That yeah. They, they went out of their way to try and get her gone, so. so. Um, hi. Um, I just first wanted to say thank you to the parent who, who came up here and um, talked about the 911 call and her standing up for her son. And I'm frustrated as a parent. Um, I had kids who go to Canyon View. Um, and a question that hasn't been asked that I'm still wondering about is, well, it's been asked in other forms, but not tonight, um, that there was kids that were coming and jumping kids in the bathroom that were affiliated with the gang. Is that accurate? So, so the student who was attacked in the parking lot was assaulted two weeks previously in the bathroom by different students. And so that, that was an investigation that was closed. Those students were arrested. Um, and is this a one-time incident or is this a multiple incident? Once that we know of, that was reported to us. Okay, because I've been well, told. Well, the letter that came from the school district, from Mr. Hatch, said that this has been a series of events going back to last year. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. That was the letter that was sent out from the I, I did research that. I don't know that information. I just know the most recent one. I don't know this young man, what his history is like going back mm -hmm. to last year. So hearing that and then obviously what's happened and transpired and the breakdown in communication and the fear of our kids especially, but even parents stepping up and communicating and asking questions <coughs> resulting in retaliation is um, sad and concerning because that's why I don't think we have as many people who are truly concerned. I am also a mental health counselor in this community and know of kids that are struggling every day because of bullying, because um, kids with this similar mentality, whether it's gang related or not, that are abusing our kids. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not okay. And I'm frustrated sitting here tonight when the people who are in charge you should be answering our questions. I appreciate you immensely being here tonight and taking some of the hard questions. Um, I've always supported you know, your, your office and the police, um, but where is Dr. Hatch? Where is the principal? Where is the vice principal? She's the one that first got the information and yet she hasn't been heard from either. Um, and where's our school board? We have two that are here tonight which have been to all the meetings and they've taken a ton of heat. I know Lauren has as well as Stephanie and my um, student or board members not here. Where are the others? Um, they haven't been to any of the meetings that I know of. Um, that as, as a community we need to address that. If they can't come to the meetings and address the hard questions, why are they on the board? Amen. So, why are you to a board meeting and ask them? I will. I will. Oh, that way coming. And this they is an used to have a meeting where we can talk to them. I, and yeah. I understand so we have to I'm there. glad. Well, to be fair, after I scheduled this meeting, after they said they, they could not call a special meeting, they are going to open up an hour <laughs> at their next board meeting. Was that next? The 21st. The 21st. Mm -hmm. um, and every, everybody will have three minutes to be heard. I don't know if there will be an answer or a question, but so that was announced late yesterday. Yeah. So finally, they counted one hour. Um, yeah. People. Can I say that honestly, board members can't be here in a certain amount of numbers and really can't answer questions? It's considered a quorum? No, I understand that. Okay. I've been on a school board. Okay. I get that part. Yeah. But We've had lots of meetings, and the two same ones are typically yeah. here. Yeah. You know, Ben went to one and got the heat, and he's nowhere to be found. Yeah. Um, the others, which mine here, Corey, is I've never seen him at this stuff. He's not. He's involved. He's been involved. Oh, good. I'm not. Haven't seen it. But you don't hear anything. Well, they have to be careful with what they do, but I, I get that the place to be there is, is next week, next Tuesday. And I wish I could be, but I'll be out of the state, so. Watch it online. Oh, what I will. Time? Next Tuesday, what time? 5.30. 5.30 is when public comment will be doing other business beginning at 4.30. <coughs> we have a hard stop at 6.30. So the gentleman who just suggested that we have an hour, which means we'll take at most 20 comments and typically those three minutes bleed so in fact it'll be more like 15 people and I would suggest that if anyone wants to be there that you that you have something tightly scripted that you read because you'll want to get all of your ideas out for those that, that can't make it use the email system send in yeah. your concerns mm -hmm. yeah and keep bugging them to get answers. answers. Eventually, they usually do. And there are good board members, like Stephanie always gets right back to me, but, you know. They're good. And, and I appreciate both Lauren and Stephanie being here tonight because this is a, a hard situation and change definitely needs to happen. But more importantly, the communication, well, the safety first, but then communication needs to happen, which I didn't receive any information. In fact, when I found out, it was one of you guys did your press release the first time and I'm like what and I was part of the remind system and I didn't get notified no did my niece mm -hmm. or her uh, yeah. ex-husband 
and they're on it. She checked her phone, see if there's any notifications yep. that she might have turned off on her phone that they did not notify her. They're not getting anything through that, and she's really upset over that. Superintendent Hatch said something about the tech system being down, and they're working on that. He said that in the city council meeting. Chief, who can access the reverse 911 system? As far as accessing to get that information? So are you to like send out information? Uh, well, so dispatch is probably the main uh, promoter of that. Uh, I can do it. Uh, I'm sure Sheriff Carpenter can do it. I don't know. Paul, can you do that from your position as a county commissioner? No, no, no. So that's a good question. I, I know that dispatch is the main one that pushes those out. So if we have a reverse 911, let's say we have a threat in your neighborhood, as long as you've signed up on the county website for those and you've subscribed, then, then that will go out. We can geofence that to your neighborhood only. Um, but, but we use that for our staff and other things as well. So Could that be used for the schools? That's what I'm wondering. Could the schools access uh, that? Yeah, and Paul can maybe speak to that as far as, because I think the county oversees that or purchased that. Maybe, maybe I don't know. The reverse? Yeah, the other bridge system for the whole county. I think we pay for it as a county. Um, as far as he's authorized to use it. I think, I think like George Colson, our emergency manager, yeah. Mike Blake, who that's his lane. Sure. I think Mike's probably involved in that. I don't know. Further than that, I don't know. We had talked about that before, but, but we assumed that the remind was working. But Everbridge, I don't know we've ever had much of an issue. As long as people opt in, that's the thing. That's the right. limiting factor. I just wanted to, <clears throat> Dan, I appreciate you bringing up the uh, of teachers being armed. Um, it's probably, I lose track of time, but I think it was six or seven years ago, I had just returned home from front sight training with my boys and some friends down in Nevada. And I was so impressed with that training. I came home and we have, as a, as a city council, we used to have a quarterly training or meeting, coordination meeting with the school district administration and the school board. And I brought it up then that I, th I thought we should have every not force anybody but any teacher janitor administrator that's willing to conceal carry on school property that we should pay them a stipend for the added responsibility and we should train them very well and because I still have a daughter in school believe it or not as old as I am but uh, I also have grandkids <laughs> But I also have grandkids, and, and I don't want, when, a, when an active shooter comes into a school, I don't want them hiding behind a teacher, cowering in fear. I want that teacher shooting back. And, uh, and I think that's the answer to school security, is arm everybody you can, have them trained, and let's pay them a stipend if we need to, to for that added responsibility. So. <laughs> Uh, back in the 70s and from that point on they opened the school up to retired veteran veterans yeah and they spend their day there get to hang out with their grandkids and they are armed and they have not had a school shooting since let's put them in the parking lot they're fantastic to hang out with <laughs> <laughs> no they can bake with them <laughs> <laughs> they can at least sit them down and joke around about well, what you do is you put them in the parking lot with a smoker and then you've got the best yep. day ever. Hand over, man. You can get anyone going to your kids. I'm so veteran. Okay, I just wanted to point out that the Utah State Law 15 4, or 53G 4402.15 Part V includes, set, is, they are required by state law to include in their emergency plan procedures to notify a student. And, oh, am I looking at the right one? Uh, I'm looking at the right one. I'm sorry. Um, they're, okay, I lost it. But they actually are required to have in their policy a procedure to notify the parents, which they do not have, and so they're a violation of state law with that too. And so I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then also, they need a policy on the firearms. Like, I'm, I'm a big supporter of, I love the fact that we have um, concealed carries there, then, and we don't know who has them or who doesn't. Right now, there is a rule that they are not allowed to know who has it, and so that becomes a problem with giving a stipend, because you'd have to know that they had a concealed carry on them. So we'd have to figure out like a way around that, but I, I love that idea as well. Um, I think it helps quite a bit, but I just want to point out a couple things. Dan, I felt to mention, when I brought that up in that school board meeting with the administration, they were very open to it, all of them. And, and so I don't know where it's gone from there, Chief. I don't I can know. speak to that after. Okay. Okay. Just 
Can you hear me? Okay. Going back to what she said, um, I think the biggest thing is it wasn't necessarily facing even the board because, I mean, Stephanie's been here, Lauren's been here, even Chief Adams has been here and faced the music. But at the end of the day, when I drop my kid off every day to Canyon View, I leave her in the care of Mr. Keaton. He is the one responsible for her and her well-being and the decisions that are being made in that school on her behalf. And as a parent, I've been to both meetings. I haven't seen him. And um, my question is why? Like why? And I think that's what she was saying is, where is Mr. Heaton? Like why are you not addressing the parents of the students that you are responsible for? We have questions for you. We want answers from you. Where, why you, why you went about the things you went about the way you did? Like why? We deserve that answer. We trust you with our children. Give us the respect to face us. Like, you know, I appreciate you, Chief Adams, coming to both of these meetings. I appreciate you, Lauren, you, Stephanie, and everybody else that has come. Like, it is a big deal. These are our kids. These are these are our priceless freaking jewels. And the person responsible should be here. He's responsible five days out of the week, six hours a day. He gets them more than I do. You know? I have questions. Where is he? And that's all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we, we've been working pretty closely with, uh, with Roy Matthews, who's the secondary education director. And since Lance has been here, i got to give him props for his focus on this issue. Um, we have talked. In fact, we met. It was before Stephanie and Lauren were on the board. Uh, but, but me and uh, Dave Stadium kind of started working together early last year because I felt like we, we need to be better. We need to drill more, we need to exercise more. We're never going to be ready, and my, my biggest fear is that we do have an active shooter like Dan said, like Uvalde. There's no reason why it can't happen here. And I think quite honestly we've been on borrowed time. Um, our SROs have done a great job averting threats when they've got in early, got the kids interviewed, taken the steps they need to. Um, and so that's been a priority of mine is to drill often and drill, drill as much as we can. We had a, a major drill in uh, December over Perlin High Elementary. Uh, my intent is to work with the school district to do that at least twice a year, if not more. We don't have to do it on a grand scale every time, but we want that muscle memory. So we know what we're doing, we know, the students know what they're doing, we communicate better with the parents. Um, but, but last, to his credit, when we came in there and had a meeting before we met with the board, it was, let's arm the teachers, let's support them. He even went as far as to say, let's buy the ammunition. And we're like, well, now wait just a second. <laughs> he said, let's buy the guns and the ammunition. Let's support everything. And he said, well, let's just slow it all just a little bit. But I appreciate his tenacity and his willingness to say whatever we can, let's do whatever we can do to, to target out of the schools. Um, and then just a couple of other points, and, and I'll be done. Uh, it is overwhelming for these SROs. Uh, we, we, last year, we had to get the district to come on board, and they've been great to work with, add a fourth, so that we could have one in every secondary school. I would love to have one in every school, including our elementary school. Those kids need to develop a rapport and trust with our law enforcement officers, and it needs to start early. Um, I had the opportunity to teach the D.A.R.E. program at the fifth grade level for five years, and also at the tenth grade level at Cedar, uh, Cedar Middle School and Canyon Middle School. That's been many years ago. So I want you to know that, that I have a deep desire to target Harvey schools, as Dad said, to the extent possible. I love these students. My youngest just graduated last year. All three of my kids have gone to Canyon View High School, so I have a vested interest. Um, but we do need more help. So whether that, Stephanie made a point about monitors, district maybe hires monitors to go and monitor the school in the parking lot. Uh, Dave Womack, who owns uh, off-site security, has already drafted a proposal and sent to me that I will talk to the board about. He's willing to contract to have armed security in the schools five days a week, six hours a day at a very low cost. So there's some options and ideas that won't break the bank. Um, I heard Matt kind of drill it over here when we talked about a single point of access, right? Just one place for the students to go. I know that's inconvenient. I've been pushing for that for years. Um, and I know it's inconvenient. It's that, it's that balance of going too far or not far enough and, and parents who don't want that restriction. But quite honestly, if we're going to harden the targets, that's what we've got to do. Single point of entry in these schools. And, and Lance has made it clear that once we do that, 
He says, we will hold people accountable. If that students and teachers profit, the doors open, there's no, there's no tolerance. So just, just a few things to let you know kind of where we're going. Can I just say something about the proper doors and stuff? They, absolutely, we knew the kids were going to do that. And I don't know if you want me to have the mic. Yeah. We did know the kids were going to do that. And they did do it. They did it today. And uh, we're on the, Don's on the phone calling the custodians right away. You got to go back, the back door's propped open, and we're doing the best we can as far as, you, it's really rough. We That school's got doors all the Are way around. Are they centrally around. monitored so you know when they're propped up? No. But that's changing. So so hardware has been ordered. That's part of the other issue. Yeah, that, that, would be very helpful. that would be very helpful. But I'm telling you, it's rough, and we we have, we have were on it. She was on it today, tell, letting them know this door's propped open, go, go fix it, go take care of it. So, I mean that that was I gotta I gotta give defense for my people I work with where I can because it's rough. I mean we do a lot of things wrong. Absolutely, I, I see a lot of things. I I sit right in the middle in the office and I see a lot and I hear a lot, and we do a lot of things wrong. Absolutely, we do. Oh, but I'm just saying that we are trying. We are trying. This was an incident that happened that we've never come up against before. And we have learned a lot of things. I think the whole community has learned a lot of things. The lockdown at Cedar Middle School, I think may have been uh, pushed forward a little bit faster because of what happened to us. So that's a good thing, absolutely. And I'm glad you called this meeting because we can learn from each other. And But I think we gotta have a little bit of tolerance for uh, mistakes that are made and not given excuses, not at all. We all have, you know, our issues. But we gotta have some tolerance and then learn from each other and push each other forward where we can, where we see that we need improvement and we can make improvement. So. Dan. Well, one second. I, I, I need to comment something to the Chief. Um, and, and looking at this and going back through all the timelines and all the things that were done, First of all, I don't believe this was a failure of policy. I believe this was a failure of decision making. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, looking at everything that Officer Carpenter did, the investigation that he put together, the coordination with the other SROs, the investigation outside of the school, working with the county attorney and the judge to get the warrants, putting surveillance on them. that he saved lives on Tuesday. And you should let him know that. Absolutely. So, no. The last three school bonds that have been requested, there has been a line item for security in every one of them. So the question is, they keep asking us for bond money, and they keep asking for these things, where are they? This young lady, come on up. My name is Amy Despain. I have two high schoolers at Canada U and a middle schooler at Canada U Middle. Sorry, at Canada U High. I worked at Canada U for three years, and my heart is there. I love it. I love the students, and I've seen firsthand a lot. I can second a lot of these things. That Canada U has a lot of good, um, but I think why we're here is to talk about the breakdowns. And I would love specifics. I would love to know where was the breakdown. And I've heard there was no breakdown. I've heard it was handled perfectly. So I want to know that. Was, was it, in the leadership's opinion, handled perfectly? Because that causes me concern. And if it wasn't, can we identify specific breakdowns? We can't fix a problem if we don't identify, identify it. A lot of generalities, a lot of emotion, which is totally understandable. I would love to see specific breakdowns. What happened? Where was the breakdown? And what action specifically is going to be taking place. I hope to speak next week. It sounds like there may not be time with 15 <laughs> people, so I wanted to go on record right now saying I would love answers. I still don't feel clear about what exactly happened as a parent. I heard Mr. Heaton didn't know, then he did know, then tonight I heard he wasn't even there. So I still feel kind of confused about what even happened. I would love clarity. I would love to know where the breakdown was, and I would love to know what is going to happen? So one of the one of the purposes of this meeting is we are going to meet again. Um, we are going to come together with some of our plans. 
So I reached out to Steve Trelawney. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he's good. I mean, he's real good. And he's not, he's not that expensive. We might actually be able to afford him. And he is one of the best in the business when it comes to creating and hardening targets. And one of the things I've heard people talk about is let's not make our schools a prison. It's not about making them a prison. It's about making them a fortress where they are safe inside. It's not about locking them in. It's about locking the bad guys out. Okay, so we are going to meet again. So if you have not, there's a, a pad back there on the table. Please put your contact information so we can reach out to you. And if you're interested in giving some more input, if you want to bring me another story of something bad that happened and don't want your name used for fear of retaliation, <laughs> by all means, let me know. And when I said that, I wasn't talking about fear of retaliation from games. I was talking about systemic fear of retaliation from the school staff. Which so, does happen. What's that? And said, unfortunately, it does happen sometimes. Yeah. All the time. We have yeah. some good teachers. And, you know, I, I love and respect those teachers who do a good job. But there are some that retaliate. So is there anybody else before we shut this all down that wants to get up and say anything? I just have one more question for um, Chief Adam. Not done, Mike. Oh, killing me, Dan. Do you get actual, like, do you, have you gotten training for a school shooting? Like, I know we're a small community, so I don't know what your training entails for our kids. Like, can you kind of clarify yeah. what that is? So we had several of our officers trained in active shooter response. Um, all of our SWAT team members are trained in that, and, and Officer Carpenter is a member of our SWAT team who's been trained. Uh, we actually are bringing in a course from the feds that is coming in May, and we have uh, 25 between St. George and Cedar, many of our officers and the deputies who will be going through, I think it's a four-day active shooter course, we'll be using one of the schools as our base. Um, I actually signed up for that, but uh, they capped it, so I, I got out so I could let one of my officers go in. And because of the popularity, we're going to bring that back again. Okay, and then one more question. Will we teach our, stu or our teachers this, what you guys are taught, so they know the same things that, so you guys are in sync, on what to do if the, if it was ever to go bad. I, I hate putting it out in there. Okay, so they will be, it'll be cross-trained. Everybody will be cross-trained. That's cross -trained. up to the board. What? That's up to the school board, and that's... Well, that should be a given. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> you're hearing it from the parent. That should be a given, so... Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a very goal, and, and we've, we've done a lot of those drills together, but like I said, if we're not doing it often, then, then it's muscle memory, sometimes you forget, so... Okay, last question. Um, as parents, so I'm a, I'm a freak. I'm that crazy mom, okay? So I, I, I struggle really bad with um, PTSD with my kids um, from losing one. So fear of losing one again is really, it, it paralyzes me, right? Um, so when I get the lockdown text, everybody wants lockdown text. I want that. But when I get them, it triggers me at times. Um, and I don't know what to do as a parent. Do I go get my kid? Do I call the school? Do I call you? Do I? We as parents don't have our own protocols and procedures on what we should be doing in those times. Sure. So we're not in your way either. Like I had my boss today whose kids went fiddlers. She called me, my kids are locked down. I don't know what, she's in tears. She doesn't know what to do. She's like, do I break, break down the door? Do I go over? The, we don't know are like because if there is something like someone's got a gun we can't walk up right. i mean granted i will if i have to but in all reality we can't walk up to the sure. school so we need something for parents on what to do when things like that happen because we don't want to get in anyone's way but i agree but we've talked about that and to, to stephanie's credit uh, she talked about educating and in fact you're brought this up as well educating parents on what the lockdowns are and what they can do Okay. So we'll work together on that because I think I think we need to educate the parents. Well, I can help. I'm a parent that would love to help. I don't want to just complain. So if they send me whatever way you can to help, I would love to help. Thank you. And to his credit, uh, our current sheriff, uh, Ken Carpenter, when he was with the Cedar State Police Department, was one of the first law enforcement officers in the state to begin active shooter training within our schools. He's been doing it for about 15 years. Hey Chief, uh, last question for me. Uh, it sounds like you, you guys are doing training and, and staying up to date on that stuff and, and you're continuing to do that. You said you mentioned some training that's coming here shortly. 
But it sounds like we somebody had brought up where's the breakdown, and the breakdown I feel like is is what you guys are doing and it disseminating to the schools, right? There's the the schools are you know they don't allow you to enforce either training or or whatever. It stops there. Um, how do we get past, in your opinion, get past the resistance? It sounds like from the school itself, the school district, uh, from what you guys are training on and trying to implement. So you said you said enforce training, not enforce it. Like you have a part. Like okay, if active shooter, Cedar PD, this is what we're doing. X, Y, and Z, right? The sheriff's department comes in. They do X, Y, and Z. But it seems like it stops there. If the school district isn't willing to be involved with that. How do, you, how do we as a, as a community, we do what we're doing sure. now, but how do you as law enforcement yeah. project that onto the school yeah. district and get them to get involved? Get them to get involved. I hope I didn't convey that that wasn't working. I felt like that is working, especially right. the last year and a half as we've been working with, with Roy Matthews and then with Superintendent Hatch. For me, in my seven years in this position, it's never been stronger with those discussions. Um, and so to that. And, and the, only reason I, the only reason I say that, Chief, is um, you know we heard uh, you were mentioning that uh, there's not really solid policies in place and uh, the principal at the school, you know, it just seemed like, and there was no communication to the parents. So it sounds like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but the school isn't doing what they're doing. I, I don't know how much influence we have sure. as a law enforcement community yeah. going towards. No, that's a great question. I think they're very impressionable. I know that, that in working with Roy and Lance and certainly the last few weeks with Stephanie and Laura, they're very open. Yeah. And so I have no qualms to, or, or fears of any obstacles that we can't move forward I and put a policy together. For yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, as, a, as a community, obviously, <laughs> you have the support of the community to do what needs to be done to, to make this better. Because we are not LA County. We are a small community that could do much better than what we did uh, a few weeks ago. Sure. And maybe just on I know is we're working with our school board to try to develop policies because we've talked about maybe trigger points so these 15 trigger points if this exists we go immediately to a lockdown one two or three and so we just we just want to make sure that that, that pendulum is not swinging so far that we disrupt your child's education and and day to day if we were to have like la multiples a day i can only imagine what that looks like but yeah. currently how many are we having I, I, I would have to find that. I don't know how many we're having. I mean, it just daily, it was, weekly, no, monthly, yearly, probably on average. I mean, today, this week was a, was kind of the anomaly, but um, maybe the school board could answer that even more so, just because it's their policy. Once a month, maybe a couple times a month. It ha it's it's yeah. not been it's not been much. But if we if we did it, the other side of that is if we do it often and the kids get used to it, to, to your point, it's not disruptive and they just know and, and we go forward. So until that time, uh, as of last week or the end of, um, I think it was uh, the Friday after the events that, that occurred, I informed all four SOs, I said until we get some things in place, because this is going to take a little bit of time to wrap up, at, at any whisper of any threat, no matter what it looks like, you're going to go on lockdown. That's what Officer McCoy did today. He immediately did that. When I got there, he said, I, I did what you told me. I said, you did the right thing. So, so that's, that's the, the instruction for me now until we get something in place and some procedures on paper. Okay, okay so now I'm confused. <laughs> do you lock down the school or does the school administrator? Well, they do, but that's my direction, so they have to say, do you have part? Yes, because okay. it's, it's, a, it's a partnership. Is there an exigent circumstances element to that where if your officer witnesses a violent act and occurrence, he can call in and shut the school down and not have to go through finding the right well, administrator? He's, he's going to have to contact somebody at the school to initiate that, right? They're going to have to. But would the other be call? in the office take his words? So as far as I know, again, I'd have to. You know, if there is a school, there has to be. There's always, there should always be a second in command where that officer goes in and says, principal, vice principal, this is what's going on. I recommend lockdown. And again, because they work so close together, it, it's not really I recommend. It's like, let's go into lockdown. Yeah. If they have a problem with that, they'll say, no, well, let's take a step back. Hold on. But they usually trust it. I doubt what they say. Yeah. Exigent circumstance. Yeah. Like, yeah, Anybody else? I have one more question. Okay. Okay. I promise I won't be annoying. I just have a, two thought So if officer McCoy calls in so if Officer Carpenter is not there, because he can't be there every day, but 
let's say he's not there. Is there someone in place of him, or do we just leave the school unmanaged while he's gone? Yeah. Same with Officer Heaps at the middle school. Yeah, sometimes they're gone. Training, vacation, they're sick. Um, they'll ask one of the others to cover, but it doesn't mean they're always physically there. So if, if Officer McCoy is gone on military leave because he's in the guard, then Officer Danes covers that school, but she's got Cedar High and Cedar Middle, so she's bouncing. But it's their moments. Who do we go to to try and get more, like, manpower for you guys and for us? Like, what City we Council. Do? City, is that where we go? Yeah. I'll go. City, is that where we go? Yeah. I'll go. So, so, yeah, school board and City Council. I'm asking for four new positions this year, and I'm hoping that guess, that's just officers in general. Oh, okay. I guess my question, though, is, too, is I, I feel like we're asking everybody else to do stuff, but what are we as parents going to do to help make changes here? Like, so, so the, the problem was brought up that where's the breakdown? The breakdown is on the school side with no policy. We've been trying to look into where that breakdown happened and it's a little cagey. <laughs> and so what we do as parents is that we go to like the school board meeting next week and we see what they're, we express our concerns. We try to find out what they're going to do. What's the plan? And that's what we need is a plan that is going to meet our needs. Now, in order to do that, we need to figure out what our needs are first, right? And so part of this meeting was, okay, where are our concerns? What's going on here? Then we'll go to the meeting next week. I think most of us have probably realized that there's some needs. Well, first, we need a policy, right? <laughs> so it's a good place to start. And then we can start reviewing the policy and saying, well, what about this? What about this? You know, and trying to figure out what we need to put in, what we don't. We get law enforcement's um, idea on the policy. And what happens, sorry to say, <laughs> and then, um, what we do from there is we see what the response is like. Now, so far this response hasn't been great from some of the board members, and I'm very hopeful about a few of the board members that we do have, though, because some of them have been responding. And if we can get the majority of them to respond to us and be updating these policies and making sure that they're getting practice, because it is by law, they, they have the duty to go in and enforce these policies, um, then we'll, we'll start getting some work. If they don't, that's where we run into a problem. Um, this is going to require numbers from parents. We've got to show them that it's more than just 50 people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. But they're not seeing it right now. They're not seeing it. And so, there are messages, there are emails. There have been lots of contact. Yeah, we're doing some grammar requests in order to find out exactly how much contact there has been. And so that is one of the, the grammar requests that we're going to have in. But what we need to do is show them that we are concerned this isn't going away. Start start with nice. You know, you don't have to go in and be a war, like, like give a chance to give us a plan. Um, but you know, see what happens at that board meeting. What's the response? We need a time frame for okay, we we need to hear back from you. We need to hear by a certain date, otherwise we're gonna assume that this is getting put off because we have not seen a great response so far. Uh, from there, if they don't respond, that's when we start reaching out to the state and we start reporting these guys are in violation of laws and we need you guys to come in and look at this. Does that make sense? Some of the questions? And I sent an, uh, an invitation to this meeting to the state attorney general's office so they're aware. Yeah. Okay. Good. I love that you're concerned about making sure that we have what we need and we obviously don't. However, policy is only as good as application. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you. I've talked about this for years that we are on borrowed time. Our demographic, where we live. I am very sure of the pattern. I've seen working there that there are policies. They're not, I mean, the doors weren't locked. That's, I don't need to go into depth. I've emailed the school board about several things and I'm worried about the urgency. So we go in, we say, let's get a policy. That takes six months. Is it applied? We don't know. That takes another six months. Oh, they're not actually locking the doors. Oh, they're not actually having a tardy policy. We don't know where the kids are. Mm -hmm. Your kid's in the parking lot. The kid's not in the parking lot. So my <laughs> question with the urgency, I mean, we all showed up tonight and just spent hours. I don't feel like we have time to wait months or years to implement this. Is there a way we can streamline? I would love to know because these failures that you guys are aware of are just the tip of the iceberg. There have been safe school vi uh, violations. There have been weapons on campus before. You don't know about, but we are on borrowed time and I as a parent feel in my gut the time to act and to be responsible 
policies need to already be done. What can we do? It's timely. You're right. Mm -hmm. All right. No, no, no. We've been here a long time. So. Can I answer that one, sir? I just want to tell them about the sample policy that can actually be put in place. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so the state board has a sample policy that the school districts can actually take and basically just put in their own little information and start using right away. They have a policy they could be using. And when I was looked at, so their policy they sent me, which included three pages of how to respond to the media, the entire thing was 50 pages long. The one that I was just looking at from the state, theirs was much more detailed, much better written, and it was like close to 100 pages. And so they have something they can use right away that is so much better than this only thing that they have. And if anybody wants to see a copy of both policies, I can send them to you too if you want. Yeah, the New York Police Department put together a very comprehensive uh, school shooting and, and active shooting uh, compendium and policies, and, uh, and that thing's 210 pages. Um, I was going to print it out and have it here. It was 65 bucks to, to print it out. So one of the options that is available to us is to take our kids out of school. I do not feel confident that the school administration and the school district can keep our children safe, and I'm at this point. So one of the things that's coming down the pike is, uh, and Lance was supposed to be here tonight to talk about it, but uh, the Fourth Square Gospel Church, the TLC, is in preparation, raising the final funds right now to build a 1,000 child uh, private school. Um, and also we have a young lady here, Candy. Why don't you come down and tell us what you got going on? Well, I appreciate you letting me still just a minute um, but what what I'm working on with a with a group a board um, Cedar charter holders is bringing a charter school here um, and we would obviously these are issues that we would be facing as we um, put together our school so it's really uh, it's really good to learn these things and what policies we would need to look at but but I mean I think it's obvious here in Cedar City there's no options for our kids other than the private, uh, other than the public school or homeschooling and um, I'm a huge proponent for homeschooling myself actually but um, I unfortunately don't have the ability to do that right now but I think it's great and I have no idea about that the private school that would be amazing um, no there's a private uh, school yeah so um, so we're just working we've been um, we were denied by the state charter board just in January um, a four to three vote um, but our, our school board is looking to put together a, a charter authorization policy, so I'm not sure how long that'll take them. But we do, we have the board is looking pretty fav favor favorably at charters. Um, again, if we were authorized through the district, would kind of fall under them. So <coughs> as a charter school, charter schools are we, public schools. Yeah, they are. They are publicly funded. They are a public school. Um, but they can. Yeah. No. They. Yeah. So. So it is. A, a good option in my opinion um, especially if you can't afford a, a private school so um, so community support is uh, we really are looking for that our school is called Amer American Principals Academy um, it's a classical education model um, and so if you're not familiar with the classical model I won't go into that I'll right now for time's sake but you can you can learn about that it's it's beautiful my kids have been in a classical um, school before and the love of learning is just I saw I mean they come home excited every day my kids never come home from school it's, I can hardly pry anything out of them what they did at school that day um, the love of learning is just not there and we have some wonderful teachers um, my kids have had some great teachers but um, you know it's not a, it's a one-size-fits-all and it doesn't work for everyone so um, so yeah, that's. I mean, we're working on getting another option here. Community support would be great if you're if you're interested in knowing um, about our school or anything. Just talk to me. Um, but any letters of support that we can get or calls to um, the state school board or local school board. Um, I think seeing that if the community, I, I think, really could see the need that we need these options um, and could and could show that that support 
behind some of us who are trying to provide those options, I think that'd be great. Is this just a high school? Or this, so initially it will open as a K through eight, but we would like to add a high school. And so we need, we need a high school and we do. Uh, we have a couple, we have success and launch and those models, those are- We have gateways. And, and there's gateway. The problem with gateways, there's a waiting list and it's it's really hard to get in there for me. There's not. Do you know how Because I had, okay. Because well, I tried to get my kids in and couldn't, um, and I have other people who, but, and so there is, but, so there's the one other option, and, and it's more of a Montessori, am I right? It's yeah, a little bit, yeah, which is good. But I think just being able to offer different uh, models of education so that families can. We need a high school. We do need a high school, and I know. So, um, and we do. But anyway. And you were going to come tell us about the uh, homeschooling co-op. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just really quick before I talk about the co-ops, I just want to point out for those of you that don't know, there is high school options. I'm a certified representative for Harmony Education Services. Iron County is the only county in the state of Utah that contracts with them for high school. A lot of people think it's only elementary, but it is actually all the way up through 12th grade this school year. So it is considered a home-based education. It's not just homeschooling. It's home-based, but you would get a lump sum of $1,800 to use towards your child's education. <coughs> that can go towards curriculum. It can go towards if they need a laptop, if they need a printer. It, there's a broad range of things. It also can go towards extracurricular activities. As an example, the tuition for my children to take dance, because it is an extracurricular and it is also a PE, the tuition is paid for out of the funding that I receive. There are tons of different options and ways that you can go through and talk to a mentor or myself on how to articulate that funding. A child that is in high school and uses Harmony Education can also attend up to two in-person classes per semester. So you can have your student going into the school for certain classes as well as doing some at home. And it can be a curriculum that you're teaching through the book or putting them online if it's something you're not familiar with or comfortable with. So we do actually have pretty decent options. I just don't know that people are aware of that. And it is a little bit of a newer thing for the high school. So a lot of families just think it's it's younger kids. And is it is there somewhere where they can go to get more information? I actually have flyers in my purse for anyone that's interested, and you guys can have my information or spread it around. I am the representative, well, one of the only representatives in Southern Utah for this program. Um, now, jumping to your point, as far as co-ops, there are two main ones right now that I'm aware of. There is a gal named Megan Ponce. She is the director of a wild and free group. Um, I know they expand through all ages. That is a little bit more generally for younger kids, and there's a, it's a lot of unschooling, which some of our children <laughs> really need right now. But another one that's absolutely fabulous, um, this one's called FOCUS, and it's F-O-C-C-U-S, which is Families of Cedar City United in Schooling. Hillary Gale runs that co-op. Um, we had a back-to-school get together and I would say we easily had about 400 kids at the park for that one. So we actually have a huge homeschool community. It just isn't as big in the high school ages because no one in the city of Utah was really allowing kids to go in person and do homeschooling or you know kind of find that equal medium. Programs like this do allow that. Uh, we also have a a way that you can structure it so that your child can be earning college credits while doing the program. So you can have your student going in person at high school, you can have them earning college credits, you can have them doing it fully at home. There are tons of ways to use that funding. So if you guys ever have questions, reach out. Um, I'll put some flyers out there and then if anyone wants to talk to me, you guys are welcome to contact me anytime. And I know the Johnson Center for the Arts is also offering, offering homeschool students uh, art classes, mm -hmm. so that if they, you know, the parents aren't big me, aren't very artistically inclined, um, they will offer those classes. All right, folks. I think we have job for a long time. 
Um, and I'm not even sure how long I have to be. They'll probably charge me another 200 bucks. But <laughs> in, in that regard, um, if anybody would like to help contribute to the cost of this room, please see me because it wasn't cheap. But thank you all for coming. I do appreciate it. And I hope that uh, we can get together again soon and have some concrete suggestions going forward.